G'day Bruce and welcome to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. Jingles and everybody on Australia, please stop the terrible Australian accent. Nobody here sounds like that. Well, I have an excuse. Today we're talking about the first British Commonwealth ship to be introduced into World of Warships, the Tier 6 Light Cruiser, Her Majesty's Australian ship, Perth, named after the town of Perth in Scotland. <laughs> Australia, calm down, I'm messing with you. Named, of course, after the town of Perth in Australia, which is named after the town of Perth in Scotland. HMAS Perth was actually commissioned in 1936 as Her Majesty's ship Amphion, a Leander-class frigate. Leander, obviously, the non-premium Tier 6 British cruiser. But she was transferred in 1939 to the Royal Australian Navy and recommissioned as HMAS Perth. At the end of 1940, the Perth was sent to the Mediterranean under Admiral Cunningham for a year where she took part in the Battle of Greece and the Battle of Crete, and at the end of 1941, she returned to Australian waters where she took part in and was one of only two Allied capital ship survivors of the disastrous Battle of the Java Sea where two Dutch cruisers, the De Reuter and the Java, were both torpedoed and sunk. Low on fuel and ammunition, the Perth, in company with the American cruiser the USS Houston, and a Dutch destroyer, the Evertsen, attempted to sail for a friendly port via the Sundai Straits, which were at the time believed to be clear of Japanese warships. The Sundai Straits were not clear of Japanese warships. Early on the evening of the 1st of March 1942, lookouts spotted a Japanese destroyer, and Captain Waller of the Perth gave the order to attack. Within minutes, the three Allied warships were surrounded by multiple Japanese vessels, and the very one-sided and equally disastrous Battle of the Sundai Strait began. By midnight, almost completely out of ammunition and having suffered four torpedo hits, Captain Waller gave the order to abandon ship. Twenty minutes later, the Houston was also torpedoed and sunk. Of the 646 crew of the Perth, 353 didn't survive the sinking. Of the 328 survivors, four died after they reached the shore. The rest were all captured as prisoners of war. 106 died during their imprisonment and the surviving 218 were repatriated to Australia after World War II. So, what's she actually like in-game? I have to admit, at first, I didn't like her very much. But that was just because I hadn't figured out the trick to playing the Perth. She's a British Empire light cruiser. They are difficult to play. And I'll explain, by going over the stats, why it was I didn't think the Perth was that good. It only has 27,100 health. Now, that's not the lowest health of the Tier Six cruisers in-game, the Russians, the Japanese, the Americans all have more health. In fact, the only ship that has less health is the British Tier 6 light cruiser, upon which the Perth is based, the Leander, which only has 24,500 health. Also, as is fairly typical by now, it has absolutely terrible armour. No more than 100mm anywhere, and that covering the Citadel. The Auber is equally poorly armoured, but the Citadel is lower in the water. The Bajoni has up to 175mm, the Molotov 150 the Cleveland 165 uh, the Leander, again, equally poorly armoured. If you have a look at the armour layout on the Perth, it only has 13mm of plating at the forward and aft ends. The Citadel plating is 100mm thick. If we remove the plating and we have a look at the athwart ship's armour, um, it's not good. Not good at all. But we expect this of our British Empire cruisers. The armour is pretty terrible on these things. That shouldn't really come as a surprise to anybody by now. So, the armour is terrible and it doesn't have a lot of health, but that's okay because British Empire cruisers get the damage repair consumable. Like battleships, they can replenish their health. Uh, no, the Perth does not get that consumable. But more on that later. Now, moving on to the guns. It's pretty much common knowledge by now, or hopefully it is, that British Empire cruisers do not get high explosive ammunition. Instead, they fire a type of armour piercing known as semi-armour piercing, which is kind of hybrid high explosive and armour piercing round. But that's only true of the non-premium British light cruisers. The premium cruisers, the Belfast at Tier 7 and the Perth here at Tier 6, both have your regular armour piercing and high explosive loadout. She has eight 152mm guns in four turrets, two forward and two aft. The firing arcs of the turrets are pretty good. The reload of the guns is quite fast, 7.5 seconds. The turret rotation speed, however, is pretty bad. With the relevant rank 2 crew skill, you can get the 180 degree turn time down to 23.4 seconds, which is still pretty slow. The shell velocity of 840 meters per second is actually very, very good. I think it's the fastest shell velocity of any of the tier 6 cruisers. Unfortunately, 
it also has the shortest range of only 12.8 kilometers of any of the tier 6 cruisers as well so there's that the secondary batteries are not very good but then again most cruisers don't have particularly good secondary batteries it only has eight 102 millimeter guns for each side in two turrets i wouldn't recommend going for a secondary build on hmas perth the torpedoes however are pretty good it has eight of them for each side in single launchers they do around 15,000 damage they have a range of eight kilometers They'll only be spotted in the water from a range of 1.3 kilometers unless somebody's running hydroacoustic search. And they have a speed of 61 knots, so they're actually quite good. Moving on to the anti-aircraft guns, I'm afraid it's time for more bad news. The Perth has the worst anti-aircraft rating of any tier 6 cruiser. It's even worse than the Alba. And it's Japanese. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> the AA rating on the Perth is so bad... I couldn't even shoot down a spotter plane with the AA guns on this ship. They're even worse than the AA guns on the Leander, which is kind of surprising, given that the Perth is a modified Leander. One of the modifications that they did was apparently to take away some of the anti-aircraft guns. <laughs> oh well, never mind. I did find one amusing feature when I was looking at the anti-aircraft guns, however. It was near one of the 12.7mm gun batteries. No, not that one. Ah, yep, yeah, there it is. Do you see that thing there clinging to the mainmast? There's a little koala bear. <laughs> G'day, mate. How you doing, Bruce? <laughs> That's a nice little touch. Um, completely pointless, of course, but I like it. Anyway, time for some good news. Speed and maneuverability. With a maximum speed of 34.1 knots, it's not the fastest, but it's definitely not the slowest of the Tier 6 cruisers. It's not as fast as the Auber, the Bidjoni, or the Molotov, but it's not that much slower than them, and it is faster than the Cleveland and faster than the Leander. It's also sharing joint first place for tightest turning circle with the Leander, with a turning radius of only 640 metres. And it even has a better rudder shift time than the Leander. And in common with most of the other British light cruisers, it holds its speed in the turn. When you're in a full power turn to either port or starboard in the Perth, the speed does not drop below 27 knots, and that's important when you're in a cruiser as fragile as this that cannot replenish its health. When you're spotted, you have to keep moving and moving fast in order to avoid effective fire. And something else that helps with that is, of course, the fact that this is a very, very sneaky tier 6 cruiser. It has a surface detection range of 9.8 kilometers. It's the best, again, of any of the tier 6 cruisers. However, don't get too carried away because the guns do only have a firing range of 12.8 kilometers. So as soon as you start firing the guns, if you're not concealed, you're going to get spotted. However, there are things that you can do about that lousy 12.8 kilometer gun range because the Perth gets some fairly unique consumables. First, the smoke generator. Now, the premium smoke generator is active for 90 seconds, which is very good and recharges in 160 seconds, but that does not actually tell you how this smoke generator works because it is unique. It works completely differently from any other smoke generator consumable on any other ship in the game. And to my everlasting shame, I only actually figured out how the smoke generator on this ship worked in the last game <laughs> that I played in the Perth. And it was only at that point where the penny dropped and I thought, oh, I get it now. That's why this ship is actually quite good. But we'll show you that during the actual gameplay. It's just easier to show than it is to explain in words. The other unique thing about the Perth's consumables is its spotter aircraft. Now, you can either use the catapult fighter or the spotter aircraft. I used the catapult fighter because old habits die hard. I was stupid. I should not have used the catapult fighter. I should have used the spotter plane because the Perth spotter plane is amazing. It lasts for three minutes. That's a minute and 20 seconds longer than anybody else. If you have the rank 3 skill superintendent, you get 5 charges of this consumable. 5 times 3 is 15 minutes. The game only lasts 20 minutes at the most. If you use this thing wisely, you can pretty much indefinitely extend that crappy 12.8 kilometer firing range by a further 3.6 kilometers for an effective firing range of 16.4 kilometers, and that is second only to the Bidjoni at tier 6. So the Perth's guns aren't actually that bad after all, providing you pick the right consumables. In the other two consumable slots, it's Hydroacoustic Search, which is always useful, 
uh, particularly if you're taking advantage of the smoke screen and nobody spotting for you and of course as standard the damage control ability the Perth like the Belfast and unlike all of the other British Empire cruisers does not get the damage repair consumable it cannot recover its health so who wants to see some gameplay yeah okay so this was my very first game in the Perth and unwittingly I even managed to screw this up uh, apparently there was a patch out since the last time I played World of Warships and it reset all of my in-game options to the default and apparently the default is co-op battle not random battle and I didn't realize until I spotted the names of the ships on the enemy team so that's a bit of a bummer because if this is a good match it's going to completely waste my first win of the day bonus but what the hell we're going to show it anyway because it's not a bad example of what the ships are like but don't worry, there is some hot sweaty PvP action coming right up. Initially I was thinking about going for that destroyer, but then he took those big old hits, and oh, actually no, I have trouble looming on the horizon just ahead of me, and I have been spotted, so I start slowing, and you do the standard thing in smokescreen, equipped ships. You start slowing, and you pop smoke. And you can do that in the Perth, and it'll work in exactly the same way that it works in every other ship with a smoke generator. But that's not how you're supposed to do it. But we'll come on to that in the next battle, when I'll show you when I finally figured out just exactly what it is about this smokescreen that makes this ship so good. Anyway, we've got a York up front, and I'm trying the armour piercing out, because it's only a York after all. Get the torpedoes away. Reversing and turning, so I can get all of the guns to bear. Armour piercing didn't really do anything. He is, well, pretty much pointing straight on towards me, and the AP bounced off his bows, so I've switched to the high explosive. And we're going to light him up with that. I am not, of course, the only person shooting at this York, and he is going to sink very, very quickly. But there is a Bayern-class battleship coming up behind him. So we're going to deal with the York, and this is not going to take long. And then it's the turn of the Bayern. The York's about to go. Didn't quite get the kill, but he's down. Now the Bayern. So... Battleship, heavily angled. I'm not even going to waste my time firing armor piercing. It's high explosive all the way. Don't do too much damage with a high explosive. I must have been hitting some heavily armored parts of the ship, at least at first. Knocked out a couple of AA guns, but nah, big deal. There's no carriers around. Looking for a torpedo shot, but I pretty much wasted the torpedoes on the York. Should have saved them for the Bayern and wait, what? Detected. It just said smokescreen set. How can I be detected? But the smokescreen is gone. I kind of panicked a little here. <laughs> what, what, what the hell? All right, I'm kind of committed. Um, I have to go for it. I do have torpedoes on the other side of the ship. The ones on this side are not loaded yet. So I'm going to close in and keep up the high explosive barrage. His guns are pointed elsewhere, but the Bayern secondaries are pretty nasty and can do a fair amount of damage to me. Now, the Perth, in common with other British Empire cruisers, can fire the torpedoes either in a narrow spread or one at a time individually. If your aim is good, do them individually, because if one hits, they're all going to hit. And that Bayern is pretty much dead. It took a fair amount of damage there, however, but it wasn't from the Bayern's secondaries. It was from that Konigsberg over there and possibly also the Cleveland ahead of him. So switch to armor piercing. See if I can get some shots off against the Konigsberg before he gets into concealment. Nope, not quite. But every cloud has a silver lining. The Konigsberg and the Cleveland can no longer fire at me. Instead, they're engaging a friendly battleship up front. Armour piercing is still loaded. The Konigsberg is still making full speed around the side of that island. So I'm going to wait for him to come out, and then we're going to try and get a salvo into the side of the ship. Shots out. And fairly decent damage. 7.5 second reload. It looks like his engines are out, so I'm going to have to narrow the amount of lead that I'm going to give. And again, decent amount of damage. Let's see if we can actually get a kill. Oh, and I took a big hit from somebody. That is not good. Yep, two battleships. That's me not paying attention to the map and paying the price. And the Cleveland is also managing to lob some shells over the island with the high firing arc of his guns and has scored some minor damage. So smoke is not available yet. I'm just going to have to do the hippy hippy shake and try to outmaneuver the battleships while sinking the Cleveland. Again, armor piercing loaded. The shots at the Cleveland were kind of disappointing, and that's a combination down to my poor aim. I wasn't hitting them at midships, and also the Cleveland, well, it has surprisingly tough citadel armor, up to 165 millimeters. 
I'm taking some minor fire from the rear. But it's the Cleveland that's going to do the majority of the damage to me. And here it comes. And yep, that kind of hurt. I could really do without him getting another salve off. And I'm not going to get my wish. And he does do more damage to me, but the Cleveland is down. Still detected, of course. Smoke is back up. Pop the smoke screen. Battleships to the rear. New Mexico, New York. Only two ships left on the enemy team. Now they can't see me. Pay attention, by the way, to the smoke screen marker circles. See how quickly they're disappearing, but see equally how quickly they're reappearing as I move very, very slowly forward. I didn't notice this at the time. It's only with the benefit of hindsight, now that I actually know how the Perth smoke screen works, and being able to actually review video of my earlier games in the ship, uh, that I was able to figure out exactly how you should exploit the way this smoke generator works. Uh, don't worry, I'll explain it fully in the next battle, which is a proper PvP round of battle, when I finally figured out exactly how I should be using this smokescreen to its best advantage. Now, single fire torpedoes. If you're firing torpedoes of any other nation, you've got a choice of a widespread or a narrow spread, but even on narrow spread at sufficient range, the torpedoes spread so far that some of them are going to miss, even if they're well aimed. The advantage of having single fire torpedoes, as the British do, is that if they're well aimed, if one hits, they're all going to hit. The disadvantage is that if they're not well aimed, if one misses, they're all going to miss. Don't worry, these ones are well aimed. They're all going to hit. Well, they would have all hit if some cheeky bugger hadn't actually gone and sunk that New Mexico for me before my third torpedo struck home. Oh well, never mind. That just leaves the New York. And did somebody just say smokescreen set? <laughs> Again, at this point, I was panicking. I was thinking, what the hell's going on here? It just said smokescreen set. If you're in any other ship with a smokescreen, when your crew tells you smokescreen set, you have a minimum of 30 seconds to loiter safe inside the smoke before it dissipates. It does not work like that on the Perth. When it says smokescreen set, you have about five seconds to get your ass into gear because that smoke screen is about to lift and you are about to get spotted. Now, New York. Again, single fire torpedoes. Again, his guns are not pointing at me. And uh, once the torpedoes are away, we're going to continue to work him over with the high explosive. But this guy is probably going to die before my torpedoes get there. And there he goes. So, that was my first experience, even though it was just a co-op battle in the Perth. 76,955 damage, and of course because it was co-op battle, I only got 1,500 experience out of it. Great. So, let's have another go, this time against proper opponents. This is the last game that I played in the Perth before recording this video. It's technically a tier 7 battle, but there's only one tier 7 ship on each team, so it's effectively a tier 6 game, and the Perth, of course, is a tier 6 cruiser. This game started off pretty uneventfully. Myself, an Omaha-class cruiser, and a Nicholas-class destroyer all steamed into Charlie, and it was completely unopposed. We managed to take it with no resistance. The enemy team had just completely given it up, and instead gone for Alpha and Bravo. I just managed to crawl into the capture circle in time to be credited with a capture room. So, hooray! <laughs> little ninja cap going on there. First enemy ship spotted, Farragut class destroyer, enemy tier 6. He's not the only enemy destroyer loitering around Bravo. There is a Fugin over there and I do spot him. Well I don't spot him, somebody else spots him. The Farragut's out of range, not going to get any shots at him. Then the Fugin pops up, there he is, and I do manage to squeeze a couple of shots off against the Fugin, but they don't hit. Like I said, it was a slow start. The enemy just let us take C unopposed. There's the Fugin. Squeeze a couple of shots off, and that's all I'm going to get. And they don't hit. So, well, on the plus side, we've taken Charlie. On the negative side, they've taken Alpha and Bravo, and the enemy team are all on the other side of the map. So, I've got some sailing to do. So, I'm approaching the headland, having a look at the Nicholas. He's taken the wide way around. He's obviously fired his torpedoes around the corner of the headland there. And I know that Bravo is crawling with enemy destroyers. So when I come around this corner, I'm going to pop my hydroacoustic search, because I don't want any nasty surprises coming at me from the other side of this landmass. There goes the hydro. 
Now, myself and the Nicholas did actually work reasonably well together here. I kept him informed when I was using my hydro, and he kept me informed when he was using his hydro. I'm slowing down here because the Nicholas has said, let me go and spot for you. That's very generous of you. Off you go. Unfortunately, I am quite fast. <laughs> And he is taking the long way around. He obviously doesn't want to run into any nasty surprises when he comes around there, either. There's the Fugin again. At this kind of range, he's popping in and out of vision. He's obviously used his smoke. I'm going to be lucky to hit him, but I'll put some shots down anyway. You never know your luck. You can't sink them if you don't shoot at them. I'm detected again. There's obviously another destroyer, probably the Farragut, who's given my position away. Oh, there's the smoke screen. That, that's going to be the Farragut smokescreen. Uh, unless he's the one who's been sunk. But there's definitely another destroyer over there. And it's not the Fugin. He couldn't have travelled that fast. And, in fact, there's the Fugin right there. He's still manoeuvring hard. And he still keeps popping in and out of view range. I get spotted momentarily when I fire the guns. That's the Fugin spotting me. As firing the guns extends my detection range. But now the island is between me and the Fugin because he pulled a hard turn to port. I'm again no longer detected. The Farragut, or whoever is in that smokescreen, can't see me, because he's in the smokescreen. Smokescreens work both ways. I fire some torpedoes off, just in case, and then I think, oh crap, the Nicholas. Uh, so I type a quick warning into chat, and that's when I notice that he's asked me to keep him informed of when my hydroacoustic search has expired. So I say, yep, fine, go for it. Myself, the Nicholas, and the Omaha are all using our hydroacoustic search to overlap with each other. So we've constantly got that sonar ping going off between all three of us to keep us warned of any torpedoes that are coming out of these sneaky little smoke screens. Some shots out against the Mutsuki. I still haven't actually scored any damage, and we've just lost another cruiser. And the enemy are way ahead on points because they control two of the bases to our one. So it's not looking too good. I haven't done any damage yet. I haven't taken any damage, but we're not doing too well. It's not through lack of trying on my behalf. I went to Charlie to fight the enemy, but there was no enemy there. And so far, I've had nothing to shoot at but pesky little rapidly manoeuvring destroyers popping in and out of view range at maximum range. Now, however, I'm finally close enough to hopefully start doing some damage. Of course, that means they're all close enough to do some damage to me as well. So, we must be cautious. I would, however, like to score some damage on this Farragut. He's been a thorn in my side for far too long. And I do finally manage to actually get some damage done to an enemy ship for the first time in this game. And it's good. Set him on fire, knocked his engine out. That's going to make him an easy kill. Speaking of easy kills, we've just lost another battleship. That's a very angry looking smoke screen up ahead. A smoke screen that launches torpedoes. Perhaps there's a destroyer in it. Let's go and find out. Oh yes, it's the Fugin. He has had a good game so far. He's on two kills already, but his good luck is about to run out because there is no way he is getting away from the Perth unless he manages to sink me. So, I know he's got a fast reload on his torpedoes, so I'm keeping the bows of the ship pointing straight towards him. Yes, that means I can only fire four guns at him, but it's not going to take much more than that with a 7.5 second reload. The only reason he would turn like that is to get his torpedoes away. So I know there are torpedoes on the way. I finish him off. There's the first set. He does have another launcher. There's the second set. And then that's when I take a hit in the side, which could have been a lot worse because that's four battleships and they're all at a range of less than 10 kilometers. Every cruiser's worst nightmare, except I'm in the Perth and I have a smoke screen. In any other nations like cruisers, if you found yourself in this situation at a range of less than 10 kilometers from four battleships, it would be game over. It's the worst possible situation to be in. Not in a British light cruiser. This is exactly where you want a British light cruiser to be, because this is feeding time at the zoo. <laughs> Just pop smoke and let them have it. I fired a torpedo spread, it was unaimed. Uh, I didn't have the right angle to shoot that guy, but there's such a cluster of battleships over there. There's a very good chance that one or more of them are going to run into those torpedoes. Oh, and I've capped Bravo as well, so, you know, that's nice. More experience and credits for me. Right, anyway, these battleships. I'm trying out the armor-piercing here against this guy. I'm never really going to get much of a better chance. 
although I misjudged how fast he was going, or rather how slow he was going. Um, unless I get significantly closer to a battleship, I'm never going to get a better chance than this to test out the armor piercing, but oh, no, there we go, yes, one of them blundered into one of my torpedoes, as predicted. Under these circumstances, however, I don't really want to get any closer than this, because that's a lot of battleships, and I don't have a lot of health, and they're going to do a lot of damage to me if they hit me with their main caliber armor piercing, so I'm going to stay inside the smoke screen. The armor piercing was given mixed results at this kind of range. Switching back to the high explosive, did somebody just say smoke screen set? They're telling lies. The smoke screen is not set. The smoke screen has gone. Time to start doing the hippy hippy shake and avoiding fire from these battleships because now they can see me. They're all going to start shooting at me and not just the battleships. I'm taking some fire, I believe, from an enemy cruiser as well. This, of course, is the most dangerous moment. I've got my torpedoes away against that New York. Right now, I'm showing the broadside of the ship to all of them. So I need to move and turn and get the hell out of there. Now, the timing of the smokescreen dispersing was pretty good. Because it's only really the New York who's in a position to put any kind of volume of fire into me. But in order to do that, he has to show me the side of the ship. And he eats every one <laughs> of my torpedoes. Can't really blame the York for sailing broadside on under those kind of circumstances. He was tail end Charlie at a big line of battleships and as those guys sailed into partial concealment around the side of the island pretty much everybody was firing at him so he needed to get into concealment as quickly as possible. Uh, he was restricted in his ability to maneuver couldn't really turn to port, there was an island in the way. He didn't really have a lot of choice there. He was always going to sail into those torpedoes but hey bad news for him good news for me. Anyway, one, two, three, four, five, six enemy ships sunk to four losses on our team, 60,000 damage done, we've capped Charlie and Bravo, and we're ahead on points. So this game wasn't looking too good at the start, but once, well, once the uh, cruiser squadron, myself, the Omaha, accompanied by the Nicholas, actually managed to get into the fight, and you'll note that we've kept the conversation going between us in chat we're telling each other when we're using our hydroacoustic search so that we're not all using it at the same time and we can keep the sonar coverage up not that there's any real sonar threat left at the moment there's only one enemy destroyer the guy in the Nicholas is keeping the communication going he's peeling off now and he's just informed us that he's heading off to capture Alpha um, surviving enemy destroyer is spotted and does not have a lot of health left and is coming under fire I'm keeping up the high explosive spam, setting fires on the various different battleships. Now, it's at kind of this point where I finally figured out exactly how the smoke screen on the Perth works. When I popped the smoke against those four battleships that all sailed in line ahead right across the front of my ship, I was paying attention to how quickly the smoke screen was being laid and how quickly those smoke pulses were dissipating. And it was then that I finally figured out exactly how this smoke screen worked. And I'm going to put it into action for the first time against that Dunkirk up ahead. I've popped smoke, but I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep moving. For 90 seconds, you can keep moving at quarter speed in the Perth and remain undetected continuously. The way this smoke screen actually works is each individual cloud of smoke only lasts about 10 seconds. But it generates a new cloud of smoke about every 10 seconds. So you can keep moving in the Perth while remaining undetected inside your smoke screen. Watch, I'm going to switch to an external camera view here just so you can see exactly what is happening with this smoke screen. So, here we go. I'm just about to pop the smoke, there it goes. Now watch. There's the first pulse of smoke. Now I'm moving too quickly at the moment to stay undetected. There's the second pulse of smoke. Do you see how quickly that second pulse? There's the third one. Now I'm slow enough that I can stay inside the smoke screen while still moving forward. By now the first pulse of smoke and probably also the second one have gone. They don't last very long at all but it generates new ones so quickly that providing you're moving slowly enough you can keep moving and stay undetected or you can just use it as a traditional smokescreen 
that works too because it's constantly generating new pulses of smoke even as the old ones are dissipating. So if you just sit still in exactly the same way that everybody else uses a smokescreen, it works. But you're not really using the Perth's smokescreen to its full potential if you do that. Right now I'm moving forward, closing the range on the Dunkirk, keeping up the fire, keeping one eye on the timer. I've got just under 30 seconds before the smokescreen dissipates. So. I want to be somewhere where the Dunkirk can't shoot at me, like behind that narrow spit of land just up ahead. If I'd been in any other ship, I would have had to make a run for it when the smokescreen dissipates, but in the Perth I can keep moving and get into position, ready, for when the smokescreen dissipates. And that's going to be around about now. Smokescreen set, and I'm detected. But I'm ready to dive into cover if that Dunkirk turns his guns on me. One issue I have found with other British cruisers because of the way their smoke screens work is that, well, the actual pulses of smoke that they generate last for the regular amount of time, unlike here on the Perth where they only last for a couple of seconds. But they don't generate smoke for long. You only get about two or three pulses of smoke from other British cruisers and then that's it. You're pretty much stuck where you are. And you can find that you're not in the ideal position to get all of your guns to bear on enemy targets. And if you're trying to manoeuvre around inside the smoke screen, it's not very big, and you can accidentally end up exposing yourself and taking fire. Well, that doesn't happen in the Perth, because the smoke screen moves with you. You can keep moving, angle the ship perfectly to get the maximum amount of guns or torpedo launchers to bear on the target, and just laugh all the way to the bank. <laughs> I like it. It's a very, very good ship. It's definitely not for beginners, though. You do need some experience and understanding of the game mechanics of World of Warships in order to be able to play this ship to its full potential. It's not like other ships where everything you need to know about it is displayed right there on the stat screen in the port. The ship itself isn't really anything that special. I mean, okay, the speed and maneuverability are very good, and the surface detection range is very good, but other than that, it's fairly ordinary. It's the consumables that make this thing special. Like the other British Empire light cruisers, it is very unforgiving of making mistakes. In fact, even more so in the Perth, because with the other British Empire non-premium light cruisers from Tier 3 and up, you get the damage repair consumable. You can recover from making a mistake, to a certain extent. You don't get that in the Perth. Damage taken in the Perth stays taken, and it does not have a lot of health to begin with. That in combination with the fact that the unique consumables on this ship, the spotter aircraft and the smokescreen, do require a bit of thought in order to get the most out of them mean that this ship does have a high skill cap. It's definitely not recommended for beginners, but if you are an experienced World Warship player and you do have a fundamental understanding of the game mechanics, this ship could be for you. What I cannot tell you is when the ship is going to be made available and how much it's going to cost you. That information has not been made available to me. I suspect that Wargaming EU don't actually know themselves just yet. It's all down to head office at Minsk. If they did know, they would have told me. But, well, it's tier 6, not tier 8, so it's unlikely to cost an arm and a leg, and I'm sure that Wargaming will be putting it on sale in the premium shop in a variety of packages tailored to fit most pockets. I'm definitely going to be getting it. I've had a lot of fun playing this ship. Once I figured out how that smokescreen worked, uh, which did take me a while, what can I say? I'm a noob. Um, it is difficult to do well in, but it's intensely rewarding when it all comes together. Anyway, that's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.